بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله وسلم عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة ما خاب من تمسك بكم وأمنا من لجأ والتجأ إليكم يا ليتنا كنا معكم سادتي فنفوز فوزا عظيما قال الله تعالى في كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا بني آدم إنا أنزلنا إليكم لباسا يواري سوآتكم لباسا يواري سوآتكم وريشا ولباس التقوى ذلك خير صدق الله العلي العظيم in the name of Allah, the gracious, the most merciful, may the peace and the blessings of the Almighty Allah be with and amongst all the prophets and messengers, including the last and the beloved Muhammad and his honorable and dignified progeny. Respected brothers and sisters and in faith and humanity, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. The subject of male and female relationships is one of the most important topics discussed amongst human beings and within the course of history. For the subject of male and female relationship could take place in our day-to-day -day lives and in every aspect of our daily life. At times, it could be a relationship within the home. For example, it could be a relationship between the father and his daughter or the mother and, her, and, the, or the mother and her son or the husband and his wife, or the wife and her husband. Or it could be a relationship, for example, between the grandfather and his grandkids, or the grandkids and their grandmother, for example. At times, it could be a relationship outside the home, for example, at school. It could be a relationship between the teacher and his students, or the students and their professors. At times, it could be a relationship between students that happen, to hap that happen to be from the opposite sex within the same school. Or it could be a relationship at work, for example, between co-workers or an employer and his employees. Or God forbid, it could even be a relationship, a secret relationship, for example, between the secretary and the employer. Anyhow... The subject of male and female relationship could also have different implications. For example, sometimes the subject of male and female relationships is studied from the angle of equality amongst men and women within a society. Thus, the subject of male and female relationships is also analyzed and examined on social and political levels and arenas as well. For example, when you have a political party running for the system, one of the most important questions that, are, that is asked often is that does this political party give equality and justice between both genders? Or for example, does it superiorize the male gender over the female gender like it has happened for most of the times? Or sometimes it could be a subject that is examined and analyzed through the religious perspectives. For example, 
does this religion give equality to men and women in the same way? Does it establish justice between both genders? Or is it a religion that doesn't give equality to both male and females? And no religion has been subject to criticism. And no religion has been subject to hate mongering. Like the religion of Islam, once we come and we muse on this specific subject, for many centuries, the Western world has accused the religion of Islam and the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him, sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam, that he was a womanizer and he belittled women and he treated them like subhumans. However, before we get into the subject of how Islam looks at male and female equality within society, Let's also glance at different religions and how they treat women. Dan Brown in his book, The Da Vinci Code, suggests that thousands, maybe millions of women were mass murdered by the church at times. And the church has somewhat belittled women even within the scripture of the Bible. Now, from the Islamic perspective, we believe that the Bible has been changed and tampered with. However, the Bible within the hands of Christians today indicates that God has not created men and women equally. God created, according to the Bible, God created Eve from the ribs of Adam. Or, at times, the Bible suggests, or Christianity suggests, that God created Eve from the leftovers of the clay of Adam. Here, God is suggesting that the female gender is not only a subhuman, but God created woman for the sake of the man, for he created woman from the leftovers of the man. And here we come and we analyze and we we observe that God within the religion of Christianity and through the angle of Christianity has belittled women to such an extent that it has said you are so pathetic that you will not exist until man has came about. But we don't find that the religion of Christianity has been accused of belittling women and subhumanizing women like the religion of Islam has. Hinduism, for example, burns a woman that stays alive after her husband. They burn her alive next to the body of her dead husband. Now, what is the crime that this woman has committed? Her husband has died. Why does she not have the ability to live after him? Likewise, we see that the Jewish faith alongside Christianity, has put all the blame of Adam and Eve eating from the tree of paradise on Eve and has suggested that Eve has a certain amount of evilness and it seduced Adam so he would eat from the tree. So all the problems of human beings today and the children of Adam come about from the evilness and the maliciousness of Eve. But yet we don't find that the religion of Judaism or Judaism and the Jewish faith has been accused of subhumanizing women and belittling women and not establishing equality amongst male and female in society. With that note, we come to the religion of Islam. One of the main subjects that is, also, that is always elaborated on and that is always the center of the discussion when it comes to the fact of Islam, subhumanizing women is the subject of hijab. Is the subject of hijab and how Islam forces women to observe the veil, but the man has all the freedom to wear whatever he likes and act, what, and act in any way that he desires. You see, before we come to this conclusion, we have to truly understand the Qur'an. And we have to ponder on the verses of the Qur'an. 
Unlike Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Muwahideen Ali ibn Abi Talib and Salamullahi alayhi suggests that don't just read one verse from the Qur'an and, may, uh, and release a judgment towards that verse before you examine the entire subject within the vicinity of the Qur'an. Meaning if it's a subject about hijab, read all the verses about the hijab within the Qur'an. If it's a subject about salah, recite all the verses about salah within the Qur'an. If it's a subject about siyam or wudu or hajj or nikah or zawaj or talaq or whatever subject that falls within the laws and the jurisprudence of the Qur'an, read all the verses from the Qur'an, understand them and then make your own tafsir and make your own judgments. Qur'ana ba'dahu bi-ba'd. Take one, one verse and take it to another verse and take that verse to another verse until you completely understand what the message of the Qur'an is in regards to the specific subject. Now, the subject of male and female relationships and specifically those subject of hijab is by far one of the most vital subjects that is ought to be discussed and analyzed and examined within any religious and and Islamic, specifically Islamic discussion. The Holy Quran focuses a lot on the subject of hijab. Why? Because the Holy Quran suggests that if one relationship in society or family goes wrong due to not observing the hijab, there could be a great amount of damage that could happen. And a great amount of damage that could, that could take place within society. And for thousands of years, you might not be able to cure this problem. Imam Ali ibn al Hussein Zain al Abidin Salamullahi alayhi says that my father, Imam Hussein ibn Ali, alayhi, on the way to Karbala, used to always narrate the story of Yahya ibn Zakaria. And in the previous nights, we shed some light on the story of Yahya ibn Zakaria. But why was it that Imam Zain al Abidin says that my father, Imam Hussein, used to narrate the story of Yahya ibn Zakaria? It's because a lady in the kingdom of the king at the time of Yahya wanted Yahya to marry his own niece. And that was illegal and forbidden according to the Sharia. Ah and the jurisprudence and the religion of Yahya at that time. And Yahya said no to the king. You can't marry your niece. The mother of that niece developed a hatred against Yahya. She intoxicated the king. When she intoxicated the king, she put that girl in the best of her garments. She sent the, she sent the, she sent the girl to the king. And eventually asked for the head of Yahya as a dowry of the girl. And the king, intoxicated and drunk, asked for the head of Yahya ibn Zakaria to come on a silver, silver platter. Thousands of years later, this, the head of Imam Hussein salamullahi alayh, is also placed on a silver platter. And Imam Hussein Salamullahi Alayhi has also beheaded and killed in the same in, in the same way and in the same brutal brutal and injustice method that took place in killing Yahya ibn Zakaria. And Yahya and Imam Hussein have many things in common. But if it wasn't for individuals like Hind within the household of Bani Umayyah, Bani Umayyah would not have been so corrupt to have the ability to kill Hussein ibn Ali. If Hind wouldn't eat the liver of Hamza, and if Hind wasn't a woman that drank the blood of Hamza, Sayyidu Shuhada, her grandson wouldn't become Yazid, Ibn Muawiyah. Thus we find that Imam Hussein wants us to know and observe that if one time hijab and the, fem the subject of male and female relationship is forgotten and belittled in society, you can have a damage such as beheading Yahya and beheading Hussein ibn Ali sallallahu alayhi And today the daughters of Al-Muhammad and the followers of Al-Muhammad 
and those who attribute themselves to the madrasa of Al Muhammad don't know how to defend the subject of hijab. At times, sisters come up to me and say, Say it, we believe Islam does not treat men and women equally. Why does Islam hold us back? We have to wear the hijab. We cannot go outside the house freely and, and wear whatever we like. We cannot flirt, we cannot laugh with the opposite gender. However, when it comes to the men in our home, they get to wear whatever they like. And they get to talk to whichever female they like. And they, act, they get to act the way they like. This is unfair. Why does Islam treat us in such a way? The answer to you, my sister, and the answer to those whom attribute themselves to the madrasa of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, salam Allahi alayhi. And in those nights, we have to open up our ears. We have to open up our eyes. We have to open up our hearts and say, Ilahana, arina al haqqa haqqan fanatabi'ah. وَالْبَاطِلَ بَاطِلًا فَنَجْتَنِبَهُ O oh Allah, show us justice, show us truth, show us the light so that we follow the path of the light, so that we follow the path of justice and haqq. When we come to the school of haqq and the school of Abu Abdullah and the Holy Qur'an that is the equal to Ahl al-Bayt, we find that in Surah 7, chapter 26, in chapter 7, verse 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defines for us the subject of hijab. Let us come to this verse and understand this verse as time would permit us. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya bani Adam, inna anzalna ilaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum wa rishan wa libasu taqwa thalika khayr. Sadaqallahu al-Aliyu al-Azim. And the first segment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya Bani Adam. First of all, why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Ya Bani Adam? And why does he not say, Ya Ayuhal Ladina Amanu? Why does he not say, for example, Ya Ahl Al Kitab? Or Ya Ayuhal Muslimin? Why does, or Ya Ayuhal Ladina Amanu? Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Ya Bani Adam? Or the children of Adam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly here wants me and you to know when I am asked about the subject of hijab and the subject of the veil I give an answer that goes to all of Bani Adam, the children of Adam not just an answer to whom? to the Muslims not just an answer to the Christians and likewise give them an answer and tell them that the subject of hijab and the veil is a universal subject that has existed amongst the children of Adam from the beginning of creation. And it's not a subject that is only confined to the religion of Islam and the teachings of the last messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But the teachings of the hijab and the concept of the veil existed in every single society and within every single religion and the teachings of every single prophet. The subject of the hijab belongs to Bani Adam, the children of Adam. And when we come to the religion of Christianity, we find that when Paul writes his letter to the, uh, in one of letters Paul, uh, in one of Paul's letters within the Holy Bible, he suggests that a noble lady and a lady of honor and a lady of respect is a lady that covers her hair. And not only her beauty, but she covers her, she wears the veil and she covers her hair. And he, Paul further on goes and says that if she cannot wear the veil, then she, she is better off shaving her hair, shaving her head. Because the hair is, is seen as a beauty. This is in chapter 11, verse 12. In the Holy Bible, Paul suggests that hijab and the veil is part of Christianity. And he suggests that this is the way that Mary used to wear her hijab. And today if you go to a Christian lady for example or a nun specifically, you find that the nun wears the veil and wears the hijab in the most, in the most beautiful of ways. So you ask her, why do you wear the hijab? Why do you practice the veil in such a way? She responds to you that it's not only enough for me to pray to, to Mary. 
It's not enough for me to love Mary. It's not enough for me to cry for Mary. It is not enough for me to live my life like Mary. It is when I wear the hijab of Mary that I tell Mary that my love for you and my love for my religion is unconditional. And today when we come to those who are sitting behind the screens of this television or those who hear me or those who go to the majalis of Aba Abdullah al Hussein sallallahu alayhi understand that it is not enough for you to cry for Zainab. It is not enough for you to ask Allah to give you your hajat in the name of Zainab. It is not enough for you to live a life like Zainab. But it is when you wear the hijab of Zainab. is when you tell Allah and you tell Islam and you tell Lady Zainab that your love for her is unconditional. It's not enough when we cry for Zainab. Zainab wants me and you to observe the hijab. And many, many, many occasions in the day of Ashura, Abu Abdullah al Hussein, Abu Abdullah al Hussein showed us that the religion of Islam is a religion that defends the concept of hijab, and he gave his own blood for the sake of the hijab. For the narrators say that at once, Imam Hussein Salamullah alayh was able to go all the way to the river of the Euphrates. He put his uh, he went with his horse to the Euphrates. The horse began to drink. Before the horse drank, Imam Hussein told the horse, and don't think that Imam Hussein does not have the dialogue to speak to his horse, Dhul Janah. You will know from the acts of Dhul Janah how Imam Hussein treated him. That when, Dhul Janah, when Imam Hussein died, Dhul Janah came down and ra'sa, his head towards the ground. He had put some of the blood of his master Hussein on his head, saying to the people that people know that I am empty without my master. And he came and he banged his head so much in front of the khaymah, the tent of Aba Abdullah, until he died. Aba Abdullah tells that horse, Anta atshan wa ana atshan. You are thirsty and I am thirsty. You drink and I will drink. I will not drink you. I will not drink before you. This is a horse. When the horse begins to drink, Aba Abdullah begins to drink. One sip he takes, the army know that if Hussein drinks the water, they'll be annihilated. They come and tell him, Ya Hussein, you're drinking water while they're taking the hijab of Zainab, Sukaina, and Ruqayya away from them. Imam Hussein jumps on the back of Dhul Janah and he marches back to the tents to protect the hijab of Al Muhammad while it was a complete lie and they had not gone to the tents. But Aba Abdullah didn't stop and say, let me drink water for one minute and then go fight them. No. Aba Abdullah, even though his heart was so, it was blazing from the hot deserts of Karbala. It was, he was so thirsty. But he did not drink because he was protecting the concept of hijab. When we come to the nights of commemorating the death of Aba Abdullah, we have to know that Aba Abdullah sacrificed himself to protect the concept of hijab. Thus when we speak about the concept of hijab, we speak about the concept of hijab from a universal angle. Ya Bani Adam, inna anzalna ilaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum. We have sent you a libas, a hijab, a veil, to number one, protect your private parts. How do we protect our private parts? When we come and we ask Rasulullah, what are the private parts of the man? He says it's from the belly button down to the knees, from the front and the back side of the man. This is the hijab that is wajib upon a man. We come and we tell him, Ya Rasulullah, what is the hijab of a woman? What is the hijab of the female? He says it's the entire body, except what Allah has revealed and the maraja have stated, that it is the hands and the face and the, the, the feet. This is what Allah has allowed us to see and nothing more. Some women, at the time of salah, they observe the hijab. But as soon as they finish salah, they take off the hijab. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is no longer watching them. As if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is no longer observing them. My dear sister, 
now give a pledge to Zainab sallallahu alayha that you will always observe the hijab of Zainab and you will not take off the hijab and if you do it in the nights of Ashura you will always remember that this was not only a pledge with you and Zainab and you and Imam Hussein, but it is a pledge between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the entire progeny of Rasulullah. And it would be a day that is unforgettable in your history. The angels laugh at a female that wears the hijab at salah but takes it off after salah. Because when she's put in the kafan and put seven feet under, they say, now you're wearing the hijab when you were beautiful and when you wanted to beautify yourself for the public, you didn't wear the hijab. Now that you have gone down and the worms are going to eat your skin off, you're wearing the hijab and you're observing the hijab. Unfortunately, some of us don't think long term. Some of us think short term. Let me not wear the hijab for 20, 30 years in the dunya, but the adab of the akhirah is much more severe. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a night like tonight that belongs to Zainab and Imam Hussein to guide every single one of the sisters in our community to go towards the hijab. Warishan. What is Rish? Rish, the Mufassireen and the scholars of the Arabic language say it's the feathers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says we have sent down upon you Clothe and a veil that protect your private parts. Warishan and feathers. Now the question is, does Allah send down heavenly veil? Does Allah send down clothes? Does Allah send down clothes from heaven and paradise? The answer is no. Like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that human beings are in need of H2O, oxygen, water, and they are in need of food, and they are in need of water. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that, it, they, that their society is in need of the hijab. Thus He has sent them the first hijab to protect their private parts, and the second hijab that is known as rishan, feathers. Here the Mufassireen have said that Rasulullah have, has stated that rishan here means a mean of beautifying the person that observes the hijab. The idea is that the hijab does not have to be a boring way of dressing and a boring way of dressing for the female and the boring way of dressing for the male. We have polluted the minds of the youth that if you become religious you don't get to dress modern. And that is why they don't approach hijab. But if we let them understand the Qur'an, chapter 7 verse 26 tells them that it is rishan and is meant to beautify them, they will come towards the hijab. وَلِبَاسُ taqwa And the third form of hijab is libasu taqwa What is libasu taqwa It is piety that takes over all of our existence, all of our body, starting from our eyes to our body parts. That is the real hijab. And that is the hijab that the men have to practice more than the women. That is the real hijab of the man. If the lady in front of you is wearing the hijab, is not wearing the hijab. If she's not mahram to you, if she does not belong to you, don't go chasing after those women. For like you will chase them, someone will chase the woman within your house. Rasulullah says, Man nas, The way you treat the woman of other household, the woman in your household will be treated. Thus the third form of hijab and the final form of hijab is the hijab that protects us and protects our society. That protects me from laughing from a, with a woman, flirting with a woman, speaking with a woman, looking at a woman in an inappropriate way. I know she's willing to speak to me and laugh and giggle and date and do whatever I want. But Islam says, وَلِبَأْسُ taqwa ذَلِكَ khair. It is the best libas and that is the best clothes that we can decorate and beautify ourselves with. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect our societies with the hijab and with taqwa and piety 
and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help those sisters that are protecting our societies with the best form of jihad. Hijab is the best form of jihad for a woman in today's world. For the world today has become religion, as Rasulullah says, has become like a coal of fire that we cannot hold on to. It is Akhir zaman the end of time. And a woman that wears hijab goes through difficulties and problems. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give strength and ability to those ladies that are performing jihad by wearing their hijab. وآخر دعوانا أن لا إله إلا الله والسلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته